hopefully one of the, at least one of the biggest pieces of legislation to go through Congress in my lifetime. And some of the things that we're seeing about this tax bill, I don't know about you, but I'm a little bit concerned about, okay? <laughs> little, little concerned about. Um, so what we wanted to do tonight was we wanted to have a town hall. And we have been requesting, just a real quick show of hands, how many of you in the last six months have contacted Rod Blum's office and requested a meeting, a town hall, published public office hours? Okay. Okay. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> Me too. Um, and actually last week I was in uh, D.C. And I delivered a letter to Rod Blum, and it had signatures from all 20 counties, okay? Congressional District 1 has 20 counties. And one person, at least one person, from each of those counties signed this letter requesting that our congressman hold some sort of public event to talk to us. Right now it feels an awful lot like a monologue, right? <laughs> okay? And not a dialogue. So we're, we're just asking our congressman to do his job and to talk to us about these really important pieces of legislation like health care and like taxes because it's important to us, okay? So really quickly, I asked you guys, um, my daughter, she's my secretary, unpaid, um, uh, put on some name tags. And what I'd like you to do is to just talk to the person who's next to you. What brought you here today? What brought you to this town hall? What are you concerned about? And if this guy wasn't cardboard, if he was real, okay, what is it? He leans a little to the right. <laughs> what is it that you what is it that you would want to talk to the congressman about? So just share with your neighbor. What brought you here? What are you concerned about? And what is it that you want to talk to Congressman Blum about? Go ahead and just visit and introduce yourself. <laughs> to talk to our representative, Rod Blum, about? What are, what are some things that you heard from your neighbors? Taxes. Taxes? <laughs> Health care. Just about everything that's going in the government is something that he has been able to really mess up. So that we're all going to suffer because of these things. And that's one of the things we have to do is realize you bring up a topic and it's probably something that he's messed up. And so that's one of the most important things about this is to get us in the mood of saying, we don't want him to be there ever again. <laughs> so I'm going to summarize a little bit of what you said, Elwood, maybe like voting record. How many of you are concerned about his voting record, the way that he's voting? Okay. <laughs> All right. What are some other concerns that you heard from your neighbors? Go ahead. Well, something I, 
when I called this morning, I left him a message that I really felt that he should be honest and truthful. And the ads that he's putting on TV, with the the couple saying what a great health plan that he, ta army tax break that he's put through, and it's not. It's not the truth. And he's and misleading people. Just so we know, so those are coming from an organization called the American Action Network. Okay, and that is a smaller division. Of the of the Cook brothers, so that's where that's coming from. So those aren't Iowa folks saying this is a great deal for me. Those are actors. No, so he should be held responsible because he is being put forth as something that he is not. I would love KCRG to fact check those ads. They should be responsible too for putting up false information. Yep, I would love for KCRG to fact check those ads. What are some other things that you are are here for? It's sold on public education. Sure, public education. And that's, that's actually something that's in the tax bill, too, yeah. is adding deductions for those who seek private tuition reimbursement. Um, and it seems to be sabotaging public education. Right. Yeah. What are some other concerns? Writing stealth phrases into the tax plan, like unborn child. Yep, yep. There, there's wording in there. Um, and I think it pertains specifically to in the Senate bill, I think it was the Senate bill, the House bill. Um, allowing for uh, unborn persons to begin 529 plans. So there appears to be kind of chipping away at the Roe v. Wade. Yeah? Other concerns uh, I brought you here? Net neutrality, because it's an attack on free speech. Sure, yeah, net neutrality, definitely. Anything else that brought you here tonight, a concern that you as have? Clam, as clammed up as he has been with us for the last year or so. The article by James Lynch in the paper the other day his guy at the Butte, John Freeman, said, uh, for, 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 he said, there will be no town halls and there will not even be any interviews done about what he called uh, stunts like this. Uh, yes. <laughs> so he's done whatever communicating he's done, which is, it's, uh, we, um, there will be no more. We spoke to John Furlan on Wednesday. Yeah. And he did mention that after the first of the year, that he would arrange for meetings. And we reminded him that the first of the year started in about two weeks. And he said, well, sometime in 2018. <laughs> so hopefully in, in 2018, um, the congressman will start to hold some public events. He used to do constituent coffees. Um, if you do a little research on the web, you can find that. Um, but he hasn't held a public event. And, and it doesn't have to be a town hall. It can right. be open office hours in right. Dubuque and Cedar Falls and Cedar Rapids. He's got beautiful offices, yeah. right? Yeah. It would be great if he was there. So we Remember, could talk we, to him. Remember, we paid for those offices. You can get another <laughs> We do. We do. Yeah. Um, so uh, just another real quick show of hands. Um, how many of you have written a postcard, you've written a letter, you've sent an email to the congressman in the last couple weeks? How many of you have called his office in the last couple of weeks? Now this is the important part. How many of you spoke to a staffer when you got through? <laughs> That's actually surprising to me because we were running into some concerns with people not getting through in the Cedar Rapids office that they were being directed to Dubuque or they were going through voicemail. So the two issues that bring us here tonight, thank you for sharing by the way. Um, the two issues that bring us here tonight are really taxes and health care. Um, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Amy Adams and I work with Progress Iowa. Um, it's a progressive group here, and, and we work on um, progressive issues, we work on activism, we work on research. And the two things we're researching now are taxes and our health care. When you walked in, there were some papers over there. Um, the half sheet had information about Iowans in the first district who will lose their health care should this tax bill pass. And I don't know if you happen to grab this. But in Iowa, just the first district, 29,000 people in our district will lose health care coverage. That might be your neighbor. Okay, that might be someone in your family. That might be you. Of those Medicaid recipients, 10,200. Um, of those, those who are on the individual market, 10,500. And I think this number is really important because many people have insurance through their employers and they think this doesn't apply to me, right? This doesn't affect me. Of those 29,000, 8,300 people will lose insurance from employer-sponsored insurance. 
So if you think because you have insurance through your employer, this doesn't affect you, it very well could, it very well might, okay? So that's just something to think about. Um, I'm going to introduce a speaker that we have here with us tonight. Her name is Mary Keeman, and she's an anesthesiologist with St. Luke's. So if you would help me welcome her by giving her a round of applause. Hi. Hello. Hi. I have no cards because I didn't want to forget to say anything that I want to say, but um, hopefully you'll forgive that. Um, you may wonder what an anesthesiologist knows about all of healthcare, and I'll be very honest and tell you not much. Doctors are actually the most ill-informed of anybody in healthcare. Um, you know, we go in and do our job, and we think we take care of patients, and sadly, all of that billing and insurance and all of that issue is taken care of by somebody else. So, ironically enough, your doctor probably doesn't know as much as you think about what you might struggle with. Um, looking at this tax bill. It has some huge implications for every single person, as Amy just said. So if we divide it into the two parts, you know there are two bills out right now, the Senate version, the House version, and in theory they're going to put them in a blender and come up with something that is a Christmas <laughs> gift, according to our president. So um, the Senate version, the danger in that is that it would take away the individual mandate to buy insurance. So for people who don't understand, part of Obamacare, one of the reasons it was going to work reasonably well, not perfectly to be sure, but reasonably well, was that it really functioned like an insurance policy should. It said we will take the best and the worst and we will average out the costs of those people and so yes, young healthy people who don't have a lot wrong with them help pay for older people or more ill people and that's how insurance works. When you get auto insurance, that's exactly what you're buying into. So. For Paul Ryan to say that um, this is just ridiculous, that healthy people would pay for people who aren't healthy, well, every time he buys auto insurance or home insurance, that's exactly what he's buying into. So the problem with taking away that mandate is um, they want to do it for cost-saving reasons, Congress does. If they take away the mandate, then um, even though people wouldn't have to pay this 600 some dollar tax every year, that income would be gone to the government. The biggest income saving for the government, 300 some billion over 10 years, is the fact that they would not have to pay out subsidies for people who are underinsured to be able to buy insurance. So again, 380 some billion that the government wants to save over 10 years, and that's why they're um, proposing this in the Senate bill. So now we look at the House bill, it's very different. It doesn't take away the mandate, but it has two other very deadly features. One of them is that it um, takes away the deductions for extraordinary health care costs. So you all know that Medicare has in the um, pharmacy program what's called the donut hole. And I actually wanted to read more about it today, and I made the mistake of trying to research it, and oh my gosh, I'm just <laughs> glad I don't have to be in the midst of Medicare now because it's very, very complex. It's very individualized what you will have to pay or not pay based on your donut hole coverage. But basically, you pay a certain amount um, with your coverage up front, and then there's a gap at which you don't get much coverage at all. And then if you spend an extraordinary amount, you again get some coverage, and that's why it's called a donut hole. So the problem is when you have extraordinary health care expenses, whether through your pharmacy donut hole in Medicare or say what your own insurance does not cover, um, which you're all familiar with, in the past you could deduct that from your taxes. And the proposed house bill is that you won't be able to deduct any of that. So for people who have very ill family members, lots of medical expenses, lots of drug expenses, um, that's a real problem and that will be a huge chunk out of your tax deductions. Um, the other thing that is not such a direct thing to all of us in the room, but actually has a lot of implications for um, medicine in the future, is taking away the tax credits to corporations that are willing to research and try to bring to market orphan drugs. So orphan drugs are those that um, treat very rare medical conditions, um, things that nobody else wants to deal with, um, maybe because the drug isn't very profitable, there's not much market for it. We see this constantly in healthcare. In, in anesthesia, you're constantly using a lot of medications. 
and we regularly have issues with supply because suddenly someone has realized we don't make very much money on this very old drug that's used and doesn't have much profit margin and so the company wants to drop it or again something that is rarely needed but it's very crucial when we need it and if the company doesn't get tax credits um, they may drop that medication. We've had issues with really the number one drug used in anesthesia in the United States um, because of funding problems. So um, that, is, that has major implications in the House portion of the bill. Um, you probably heard about this PAYGO. Um, you know, one of the ideas is if uh, they get this tax bill passed, they will still at the end of the year have to face this issue of PAYGO and the idea behind that is that the Congressional Budget Office every year has to essentially try to even out um, the budget so that we don't have too much deficit spending. So PAYGO was instituted years ago. What I read was originally under H.W. Bush. I'm not quite sure on that fact. But um, the idea is that if the budget needs to be balanced better, they can take money out of certain programs and the number one program that they can take this money out of is Medicare. So they can take up to 4% of the Medicare budget um, out, of the, out of play in order to balance this tax cut that they want to give everyone. And so you might say, well, I, you know, I don't use Medicare yet, I'm not 65. Well, Medicare covers people who are on disability, it covers people who have renal failure, it covers um, every hospital you will walk into in the United States, so all of our hospitals, federally qualified health centers like um, the Eastern Iowa Health Center on 3rd Avenue, that receives some money from Medicare, not much to be sure, but some. Um, you know, people don't realize the extent to which Medicare really does cover facilities and um, many, many people who are not beyond the age of 65. So if you're talking about cutting 4% of that budget, you're cutting a broad swath through this country in terms of health care. Um, so probably the most disturbing thing that I have read in the last two weeks is Paul Ryan finally admitting that once they get this, health, this uh, tax bill passed, they feel that Yes, it may lead to other deficit issues, you know, we can't really predict, and they will then go after Medicare, Medicaid, Social Security. So even though under PAYGO they can't go after Social Security, Medicaid, SNAP, the post office, they nonetheless, some of these leaders in Congress, definitely have it on their agenda to next go after the rest of what they call entitlements. So I think that's extremely disturbing because to me in this country, one of the things that we should be offering to everyone is a safety net. Um, the safety net that was put in by FDR, by Johnson, by people who understood you have to have a health care safety net, you have to have social security, you have to have something for people who are widowed or um, suffer death of a primary um, um, earner in a family. And they want to take away all of those safety nets. And again, we're the wealthiest nation in the world. People should not have to worry that they are going to lose that safety net. So it's, it's shocking that that is next on their agenda, whether they wish to admit it or not. Um, as far as what we have right now, people aren't always aware that the Trump care, um, as we like to call it, is already very destructive. People are being sold um, policies, insurance policies, that don't begin to cover what Obamacare made by law um, a fact of coverage. So you had to provide certain preventive care, you had to provide a certain level of care. There have been articles in the New York Times over the last week, and, week or two that describe situations of patients. One was a gentleman who had a heart attack, had to have emergency heart surgery, he received massive bills, none of which were covered by the skimpy um, policy he had bought. So yes, he had, I hate to even tell you how much, hundreds of thousands of dollars in bills, and the company was refusing to pay. Um, you know, again, we're taking a step backward in this country when we take away preventive health care, and when we try to um, 
sell people things that do not provide the comprehensive basic coverage that they should have. So these are just the issues that I look at in the tax bill. And again, interestingly enough, as so many people have said, this isn't really a tax bill. It's basically just a gift to wealthy people and an elimination of health care in the United States. That's what this bill is designed to do. So that's all I have. Anybody have any questions? <laughs> And you know, the only other thing I would like to say before I step down, um, I was saying to Amy before we started, the most frustrating thing to me is I go into work, people say, oh, I read your letter to the editor. Oh, you know, I'm so pleased with what you're doing, calling your representatives. And what I want to hear is that letter made me call someone, that letter made me write, that letter made me, yeah. So, you know, that's the only thing I would say. All of you are obviously very actively doing that. But what we have to do is get everybody we know fired up as much. It's not enough to inspire um, the thought of what we should stand for or what we should do, but you have to get people to be willing to do it. And it is so simple to pick up a phone and call takes very little effort. So that's my parting shot. <laughs>actually a perfect segue uh, into what I what I wanted to mention next. Um, you guys probably know this number. You probably have it on your phones. If you don't, 202. <laughs> write it down. 202. 225. 202-225-2911. Let's say that one more time. 202-225-2911. This is a number to uh, Representative Rod Blum's DC office. I was told they have three phone lines. Be patient, keep calling, and then call again, and then call again, and then call again, okay? Keep calling on this bill. There are so many different pieces of it that affect so many different people in so many different ways. And like Mary mentioned, you know, this is a tax bill, right? That's, that's what it is written as. It's written as a tax bill. But when we look at it, it's much more than that. And when you're paying for tax cuts to the 1%, to corporations, by cutting Medicare, we need to call on that. And we need to tell our congressmen that that isn't OK. I don't know about you. <laughs> but I don't own a private jet. Maybe you do, and that's fantastic. <laughs> but I don't need a deduction on my private jet, okay? And I don't, I don't own a golf course. Maybe you do, which is awesome. That's great that you have that opportunity in the summer. But I don't need a deduction for operating and owning a golf course. I need a deduction for medical expenses. My dad, Who's, who's being treated for cancer. He needs those medical deductions, okay? I need deductions for that little one that's running around out there, all right? I need deductions for my family. Those are the things that are important to me. Student loan deductions, right? Those are the things that are important to middle-class Iowans. We're not thinking about private jets and golf courses. So there are so many different points to call in with this bill. Um, if you didn't grab a card, please grab one. It has Ernst, Grassley, and Blum's numbers on it. Um, keep calling, keep calling, keep calling. Or if you have five calls out, I'll <laughs> remind you every day to call them. There <laughs> are right postcards. There. So if you want to write a, a letter to the congressman, um, we will deliver those next week. There's also a very large letter over there behind Cindy. Um, if you didn't get a chance to write down your concern, write your concern on that and we'll deliver it. The other thing that is in the House bill that's not in the Senate bill, but again, it has huge implications for health care going forward for people of modest income. They, um, you know, graduate students get tuition uh, forgiveness, right, and so, you know, now they want to make them pay taxes on all that money that they never see. And I thought it was interesting, today online I read that there are 10 Republican uh, representatives who 
realize they're a little bit alarmed about that, and they think maybe that should come out of the bill. So again, you know, don't just contact Rod Plum, but contact other representatives and say, what are you doing to um, PhD education in the United States? You had your hand raised. I'm sorry. Well, I am actually to the point where I have called, and I am so frustrated. I don't think they are going to do anything as far as listening to us. I just wonder if there's other things we can do. Or I mean, I know it's important to call, I do, but I just... So what happens with your call is this. They log all of that information into their database. And I forget what that's called. It's called something. Um, and they keep track of who's calling and what they're saying about the bill. And I was told that the gentleman who does this, I believe his name is Brandon Kirby, um, he works in Congressman Rodwell's office, and he shares this information with Representative Blum. So he is aware, this is what I was told, that we are calling and what our concerns are. So I know sometimes it does feel like you are beating your head against the same brick wall over and over again. And you call and you call and you call, and then they vote, and then you wonder what happened. But I think it's calling. better to call DC or to call Iowa. It all Both. goes to the same database. Same it all goes to the same database. And I think you also need to make sure they take your name down and your mm -hmm. address in order to get it in their tally. Yep, and and just you know always. I'm a resident of the first district, give them your zip code, make sure they know where you're from. Um, we, we go to their offices often, uh, Thursdays, if anybody's interested, we, we go on Thursday. Um, office visits, phone calls, um, emails, you know, letters, but phone calls are certainly the more, most direct, and office visits are good too. Uh, Senator Hogue, you had your hand. I did. Uh, Mary <laughs> said something I want to make sure I understood. So that because the image of the graduate student that's been putting out there is the person who's getting uh, his or her, you know, fourth degree in, um, you know, some sort of uh, exotic uh, subject matter. But does that provision apply to all of our, all of our future kind of healthcare providers who are going to medical school? It does. I was I read it oh as graduate students and professional students. So the, the figure I read was that there are eight thousand students in Iowa alone who are affected by this, graduate and professional students. So yes, you kind of wonder what you talk about a healthcare provider shortage. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. You know, to to pay uh, you know like, it's for those who don't know it's expensive to go to medical school. <laughs> People researching cancer cures and AIDS cures and MS cures, and all of those labs as well. And I think the, the point to consider with that is we don't want to close the door to higher education to only those who come from wealthy backgrounds or wealthy families. We want the best and the brightest going into those fields not just those who are born into families that are healthy and wealthy. Um, the last few minutes of this town hall, um, if our, if our uh, representative was here, um, we would hope to have a Q&A, right? Um, instead, we're just gonna have a Q. <laughs> because we don't have, well, we, yeah, so. Right. Um, so there are some note cards that have been passed down. If you would like to ask our representative Rod Blum a question, um, we would like to give you the opportunity to do that. So this is being live streamed. You can see several phones all over the place. Um, we are also recording this. And we are going to share this with Rod Blum because we feel it's important that even though he can't be here, um, that he still hears your questions, okay? There are a couple of other things too. We've got postcards, all right? So if you have postcards that you want to write out, we will deliver those. They will be dropped off at the Cedar Rapids office. Um, we have a really big letter over here, and it just says, uh, Representative Rod Blum, we, your constituents and fellow citizens of Congressional District 1, respectfully request that you hold public published events to speak with your constituents. It has been 